I love nature. I was collecting insects because I thought that was just wonderful. Then I started collecting leaves. I didn't think too much about dinosaurs and fossils, but I love nature and I love biology. On the side, in the summer, out of the classroom. And when the time came, and the time was right, I made it to college. And uh, I made it to college as an artist. And when the time was right, I started to understand that this biology stuff was pretty interesting. And evolution was pretty interesting, and fossils were pretty interesting. I wasn't sure what I wanted to be, an artist, paleontologist, I didn't know. But one day I walked into a museum in New York, and it all came before my eyes. I saw that the adventure that I used to love so much as a kid over the summer, imagining myself going down the Mississippi River, traveling, the art that I so much loved in school, and the science of discovery, of discovery of old things and bringing their lives uh, back was what I wanted to do. And I wanted to do it now. And I became a paleontologist at that very moment. And I'll never forget that first trip. You know, uh, I, I was uh, a greenhorn at this university. And as an explorer, the greatest places to explore are places you haven't been. The greatest places to explore are places where enough discovery hasn't happened. And as a person, you gotta convince somebody of the impossible. That you're gonna go to some place you've never been and you're gonna do something that no one has ever done and considers unlikely but they got to trust you that you're going to do it. And so they gave me a small amount of money. I went down to Argentina, ran into some Argentinian students, and formed a team. And we were given no chance, even by the Argentinians. We were given no chance. We all thought we could do something. They thought it was going to be a hopeless disaster. We didn't even speak each other's language. I was just learning Spanish. And we went out, and we found 300 fossils. A couple of those included the first skull and skeleton of an early dinosaur. And that was the beginning of a, of a long series of discoveries. But uh, that's really what discovery is about. It's about doing things that other people think are unlikely. It's about going places where people haven't been. There's usually some reason for it. The reason is usually that it's hard to exist out there. It's hard to do those things. And it's the hard things that haven't been done. But if you really enjoy adventure, and you enjoy camping under the stars, and you enjoy meeting new people and discovering things that no one has ever seen, then that's the life for you, paleontology. It's a great discipline. I'll never forget how it happened. We had found a lot of bones, but we hadn't found a complete skull or skeleton of an early dinosaur. There was one area of the valley that we were slowly marching our way down that we had just about to leave, and I, I didn't see any footprints. I didn't see anybody that had seen this little corner, and it bugged me. And as we marched down the valley, we were now half a mile away from this place. And I said on a Sunday, it was our day off, I said, listen, I, it's a Bermuda Triangle back there. I feel there's something in it. Uh, I'll take anybody that wants to take a good part of their day off and come with me, but you know, I, I gotta go back. I can't, I can't sleep at night. <laughs> we drove back to this area. I put down my, my bag. And I walked up, we'd all dispersed. I walked up and I saw this fossil on an edge of rock. And I walked up to it and I could see in front of my eyes the skull of this early dinosaur, the first one that had ever been found, diving into the rock. There was a piece of its neck it was just out of place. It probably would have washed away the next year. I rolled it back into place. And we dated those rocks. Those rocks are a quarter of a billion years old, 228 million years old. This fossil had existed and was about to wash away. And I come up and find it. And I gave out a yell and people thought either I fell over and died or I had found it. And that was a glorious moment. And we all grouped around. I walked away actually while the people were gathering around the fossil and just in utter amazement because it could have been found in many other ways. It could have had the tail sticking out. The way it was preserved was just so glorious. It was such a moment to remember that I just sat down and cried, and they all came around, and they had said they said they'd never seen a scientist react like that to a fossil. But at that point, you realize that that was, was the beginning of a, of a career. Uh, it was the beginning of something that was going to be truly great, and uh, it was just a great moment. I'll never forget it. We found 
an interesting site in western China that we're going to be describing in a few months. It was a site where we had not one, not ten, but more than 20 individuals of an ornithomimid dinosaur. Ornithomimid dinosaur, they look like ostriches, piled up on top of each other. As we dug in, further and further, more and more of them. Now the super interesting thing about these dinosaurs is that they seem to be buried all at once. For that story, we had to really look carefully at the mud that surround them. They were trapped in mud. Suddenly, it seems as though we found the first population of dinosaurs. What's even greater is that when we aged them, we found that they were no hatchlings and no adults. They were all teenagers. They were all six, seven, eight years old, forming a herd that wouldn't you know it, without any adult supervision, got stuck in the margins of a lake and gave us really the first population of dinosaurs, the first natural herd of dinosaurs that, that has ever been recovered. But snapshots like this from the fossil record are what help us understand the biology of dinosaurs. We understand now that, well, we should have predicted that we'd find herds of teenagers because dinosaurs are very much like birds, but they, they don't grow in one year like birds. They grow fast, but it takes them five, six, seven years. So while mama and daddy dinosaur are sitting on the nest once or twice a year, where are all the four and five-year-olds and the six-year-olds and seven-year-olds? Well, we think we found the smoking gun. They were probably roaming around in herds, unchaperoned, and looking for trouble. I think uh, dinosaurs, and fossils in general, but dinosaurs more than anything, they are the icons for the past. Um, we live in the present. Everything we see and sense is today and yesterday. And it takes us on a time travel, time trip back in time, to a world that we can only imagine. And there's nothing more that kids like to do that uh, it's a human, human, basic human uh, talent, which is imagination, to imagine past worlds. Dinosaurs do that more than anything. They have personalities, they have habits, they have lives. And, and kids love to imagine a, a life far gone in the past where animals, bizarre animals, fearsome and, and imaginary existed. And, and, you know, and, and as a scientist, I'm, I'm lost in that world. And I'm just trying to bring it back and I'm wandering around discovering new things. But, but kids love that too. It's a basic human, human uh, occupation, imagination. I like to, to bring everybody on board, and especially kids, uh, and, and the effect is that they tell other kids, and those kids tell other kids, and I was there, and blah, 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 and an excitement is generated over discoveries. I like to, to have that, that inclusiveness at the time you really announce the big findings, because it then has a relevance for society. And we, we ultimately need rational thought. We need science literacy if we're going to survive as a species, more so now than ever before. It was a Sputnik in the 1950s that generated sort of an emergency feeling about science and how we need to train more scientists. And we've lulled ourselves into, into complacency in the years since that time. And, and what's really reawakening us now is, is our changing world. And we've got to have the engineers and the scientists uh, in the generation to come if we are actually going to survive as a species. We need them. And so when we have a science discovery, a dinosaur, a molecule, I don't care, it can be anything. We really need to bring it to the public in a bigger way than we, we have been doing.